Oh, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know our next speaker, you, you're, I, I almost feel badly because now your life is about to change. My friend Michael Port has created a system called Heroic Speaking, and he is the guy, him and his wife are the ones behind the scenes creating the most amazing speaker. So if you want to do professional speaking and getting on stage more and, and presenting in a really amazing, authentic way. I know this sounds like a commercial, but it is, it's really, everyone I know who's gone through it has said it's been a transformative program. Michael Port is a man. Michael, you ready to rock Momentum Rocks? Always. <laughs> and I like it's so your- great to see you. You look fantastic. And I love your office there. I love your set. It's fantastic. You like that. I like your, although is yours, is that a, a background? Is that- no, no, no. This is, we're in right now Heroic Public Speaking HQ. So this is our headquarters and we have 10,000 square feet. And what you see behind me is uh, the theater. So I'm on stage. That's- I'm just facing the back of the stage. Uh, that and you is- see some of the seats behind me. That is awesome. So that's, so you can see Michael's got the professional stage, the theater. I've got vinyl records and Ferris Bueller posters. Michael, heroic speaking. Um, I know we only got, 50, we only have 15 minutes. I know your, your programs are multiple days. So let's try to get the best of the best of the best kind of jammed in. Tell us about heroic speaking and give us some really good tactical things we could do to be better speakers. Sure. So at heroic public speaking, we can uh, make you a better public speaker. And it's 100% guaranteed. We can't turn everyone into Martin Luther King, of course, but yeah. everyone can get better because what we do is focus on the craft of speaking. Now, when most people are given an opportunity to give a presentation, they start with an outline, but usually that outline is produced in the form of slides. Mm. And once they have those slides, they'll go through it in their mind a couple times And then they'll use those slides as cue cards for the actual presentation. And then during the presentation, they wing most of it and hope that they rise to the occasion. Now, okay. Have you been studying? Have you been studying my talks? Because that's exactly what I do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's, you know, look, if you are naturally charming, like you are, if you've got good content, uh, then you know, you can get away with doing that because frankly, uh, and I say this with all respect to the overall industry, the bar is pretty low mm-hmm. in public speaking. Right. Uh, people don't expect a lot uh, when they go see speeches. So if you can improve your craft, and I don't just mean, I don't mean you, Ryan, but yep. if one can improve their craft, even just a little bit, they will stand out in a significant way. Look, here's the thing, you know, you've probably heard that the military says you can, you will not rise to the occasion. You'll fall back on your training. Hmm. And the same thing is true when you give a speech. If you, if you think that you're going to rise to the occasion that somehow the spirit will overtake you and what you will do on that stage is better than you've ever done before anywhere else. uh, I think that's faulty thinking, frankly, because what happens is when we're performing, we perform as well as we've rehearsed. And if we haven't rehearsed, then we probably are operating below our potential. Now, uh, very often folks say, listen, I don't like rehearsal because rehearsal makes me stiff. Rehearsal, I lose my natural ability to be quick on my feet. Mm -hmm. Well, that is absolutely correct because if you have that experience, it's likely a result of doing a little bit of rehearsal, Mm -hmm. not enough rehearsal, because here's what happens when you do a little bit of rehearsal. When you're performing, rather than being in the moment, you're trying to recall what you did in rehearsal. And as a result, you feel slow because of course, it's not coming to you quickly. And if that's the case, you're trying to connect with the audience and you're trying to remember what you had done and you're trying to remember what you're supposed to say and the whole thing starts just grinding to a halt. So if you are serious about performing, meaning if the stakes are high, for the presentations that you give, Mm -hmm. if the stakes are high for the presentations that you give, well, then you put the proportionate amount of rehearsal into those presentations. Now, if the stakes are really low, if you're going to talk to your, you know, kid's fourth grade class, I'm sure winging it would be just fine. But if you're on a, if you, if you're on a big stage or if you want big stages and if you want to change the world through the work that you're doing, if you want to have an effect on people so you get them to think differently or feel differently or act differently, then 
generally the content needs significant attention and the performance needs significant rehearsal. So with that being said, someone like me and probably most people are doing exact, it's, it's funny, exactly what you said is what most people do. The yeah. presentation, the PowerPoints, and we kind of use that as cue cards. Give me one or two practical strategies we can do. What, what do you think, like, how do we get out of that? Okay, we got to rehearse, but what are we rehearsing? Do we just scrap that? How do we kind of yeah. rebuild it? Yeah, at Heroic Public Speaking, we have a rehearsal process. Now, this rehearsal process is a seven-step rehearsal process that we learned when we were in graduate school for acting. So I have my master's in acting from NYU. That was about 20-some-odd years ago. And my wife, who is my business partner, Amy, she has her master's in acting from the Yale School of Drama. And we were in those two programs at the same time. And you would not have a rehearsal process unless, unless you went through a training program like that. So we don't expect anyone to know how to rehearse. One of the things that holds people back is not knowing what they even need to know. Often people will come and work with us and they'll, they'll scratch their heads and go, I, I didn't even know I needed to know that. And so the rehearsal process is a very, very structured step-by-step -step process. And it starts with what's called a table read. Okay. You don't start getting up on your feet until you've actually read all of your material. Even if you're not scripting word for word, but you're outlining it, you sit at the table and you do that multiple times a day for a couple of weeks. And that's going to help you improve the content because you're going to realize very quickly what's flowing, what's working well, and what's not. Because if you do write it out, often you're writing as if you're writing an article or a book. And that mm -hmm. style of writing is not necessarily what works on stage. So number one, you do the table read. Then you move into a process called content mapping. Now, content mapping is a, is a pretty comprehensive process. So uh, I'll only address just a little bit of it, which is operative words, beats, transitions. Operative words and operative phrases, those are the key words and key phrases in, in all of your thoughts. And then the beats, uh, and the transitions help you move from one bit of content to another bit of content. And very rarely, we're not putting focus on these three things. Now, once you've done table reads and content mapping, then, then you get up on your feet and you start blocking, staging the actual performance. Now, very rarely do people do this. And it's one of the reasons they have trouble memorizing. Because if you try to memorize for rote, it's very, very difficult. But mm -hmm. if you can memorize based on where you are on the stage at any given moment, uh, then you can connect physically to what you're doing, what you're saying, and you remember it much more easily. So when you move on stage, anytime we move on stage, we should know where we're going, when we're going, and why we're going there. Where we're going, when we're going, and why we're going there. Otherwise, what happens? We wander around because we've got this extra energy. We want to do something with it. So we just pace back and forth. And sometimes it, we turn into this like stalking, hulking creature just <laughs> laterally on the stage. So that doesn't necessarily help us. So we've got uh, table reads, content mapping, um, um, and then uh, blocking the and the staging. Yep. And as I said, there are a number of, of other, other, other steps. But even if you just did those three, first three steps, you will be so far ahead of what most people are doing when they're preparing for their speech that you'll be best in class. And if you're best on class, when you're presenting, you will get requests to do more of that every single time you walk off stage. And if you're giving a speech and you're not getting requests to do that again somewhere else, then the speech is not yet a referable speech. It's not uh, ready, I think, for prime time. Because every single time you deliver, it should affect people in such significant ways that they think differently, they feel differently, and they act differently. And if you can do that, then every time you walk off stage, you'll get requests for more opportunities to speak. It's really interesting because the way you, and you've used this word multiple times throughout, we get, we always say it's a talk, it's a speech, a session. You kept using the word performance. Yeah. And there's, it's, there's a, with just saying the word performance mentally changes the way you think about it. Absolutely. You know, you know, if you see yourself as a speaker, then you see yourself probably as someone who shares information, hmm. which can be very, very helpful. Right. But sharing information doesn't necessarily change people's behavior. If you see yourself as a speaker, then you probably believe 
that you need to call on all of the tools at your disposal. So your body, voice, pace, pitch, timing, the space around you, blocking and staging, audio and visuals, and so much more. And look, sometimes people are uncomfortable with the word performance or it's provoking in some way because mm. they, ha they believe that if you're performing, then you're faking it. Right. That somehow performance is inauthentic. And yes, it absolutely is manufactured because the stage is a manufactured environment. If people are sitting in the audience and not speaking for 60 minutes while you're speaking, that is a manufactured environment. And so the question is, how can you perform in a manufactured environment in a way that demonstrates your authenticity so that every single thing that you are doing and saying to them is real? But of course it is, and we're thinking about it from a performer's perspective. And when you think about it from a performer's perspective, you start to see the world differently. Yeah. Yeah, I... You're thinking more about the experience that the audience has right. rather than just, here's the information I'm sharing. Right. Those are two very, very different things. Very different. And I, look, I, I definitely think like that. When I get on stage, I think like I'm going to perform and give them that. What are one or two tips we can do to get over either being nervous or over relying on, on visuals or sure. feeling frozen? So, yeah. I'll, I'll do the second one first. In terms of visuals, we recommend that you don't do any visual creation, any slide design until the whole speech is done. Mm. Because you're gonna run into the problem that I mentioned in the beginning where you create an outline based on slides and then you constrain the content creation to fit into that structure. Right. But that's not necessarily gonna give you the, the best opportunity for creative expression. Anything you put up on a screen should only add to the experience of the audience. If it just does what you're doing, if it says the same thing you are saying, then one of you is not necessary. Yeah. So hopefully it's the slide that's not necessary because if you're not necessary, then of course you could just send them all the slides and the information's in there and you can move on. Right. But in terms of how do you deal with the nerves? I think there are two, two things that we can do. Number one, know what we're doing. Now, that may say, sound obvious, but you're much more comfortable when you feel like you know what you're doing and you're mm -hmm. prepared. And so what you're doing on the day is what you planned on doing. Yeah. And if you do what you planned on doing, you'll feel good about the work you do no matter what the outcome. So that's number one. Number two, we don't focus on ourselves. When we focus on ourselves, we become self-absorbed. We think more about how people think of us rather than how we're trying to affect them. And if you go into any kind of presentation uh, situation where you're trying to get approval rather than focusing on the results you're there to produce for the audience, mm -hmm. then you're, you tend to make decisions that pander to the audience that are about you and making you look good or making you look smart. And those don't necessarily help you create a, a show or an experience, a keynote, a breakout, a workshop, a presentation that is going to change the way those folks see the world, the way they feel and the way they act. So those two things, number one, if you really feel like you know what you're doing, you're a lot less uncomfortable. And number two, Rather than focusing on getting approval, we focus on getting results. And look, I'm the first one to admit, I, 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 there are not a lot of people who become actors because they don't want approval. Mm. But I've spent years working to get away from that. So you, you, your nerves go away when you're not trying to get people to tell you that you're great. And you can just focus on doing your job. And of course, if you produce results, what happens? You get approval. How much does this relate? Yeah. Now there's, there's obviously a few different types of talks. There are people who give professional talks where maybe they're paid by a corporation and they get five or $10,000 and that's it. And then they leave. And then there's, you know, you've, you've seen, and I'm sure you've been to events where it's the whole idea is to get on stage and to pitch and sell. Mm -hmm. How much of this now, obviously it's 
a lot of this is going to relate. The, the stuff you teach isn't about selling and converting. And, and if you are, if your idea is to get on there and pitch and do your, your 20 minute close, how much does, does this change, if at all? Well, so look, the pitch fest is yeah, what you're referring to. Exactly. exactly. Um, we do not teach that. We don't uh, subscribe to it. Uh, but we teach people to be best in class. And when you're best in class, uh, you don't need to pitch the way that uh, others might. Mm -hmm. And if you're designing a speech that's only about selling something, then let's just call it what it is. It is a sales presentation. Mm -hmm. And that's what it should be called. And it, yep. and, it, and it should be addressed as this is a sales presentation. I'm going to give you, all, I'm going to introduce you to this whole concept. I'm going to, you know, hopefully get, you know, convince you to come and do this thing with me. I think be completely upfront about it. But what we, but what we see that, that hurts our hearts a little bit is when a speaker um, is manipulating the audience. Yeah. Uh, and the whole thing is designed to get them to buy something, but they're not really upfront about it. Right. And so uh, the speech is crafted to sell rather than crafted to serve. And, you know, people will argue with me about this, I'm sure, but uh, everybody is entitled to their opinion. I, I'm with you. I've, di I've given both one, types. I agree. Yep. Yeah. I don't think there's any one way to do any of this work, mm -hmm. but uh, I know I was a professional speaker. And when I was speaking on the keynote circuit, I was earning $30,000 a speech. I never needed to pitch myself because the work stood on its own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're doing a, a, a large event, and uh, the whole event is for the, uh, for the students. If we have something that we want to offer people, so there's a next step, we will have a separate session that is specifically designed to address that. Right. And then if they want to come to that, they come to that. But when you mix the two, now you start to get into a, a grayer area. And uh, we just like keeping things clean. Simple. And, and Michael Port, you rocked it. And, uh, for people who want to learn more about you and heroic speaking and, and maybe spend a few days in that amazing theater there, because you're, I think you're based at, are you in Jersey or Pennsylvania? You're, yeah, we're in Jersey, but we're on the border of PA and New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. I knew it was right around that area. Um, how could, and you already get, wow, lots and lots of great feedback already. Uh, the same. Thank you. Love this. Awesome. Very helpful. Uh, what's the best way for people to learn more and, and connect with the amazing Michael Port? Sure. Heroicpublicspeaking.com. <clears throat> heroicpublicspeaking.com. And then when you get there, you'll tell us what kind of speaking you want to do, and then we'll be able to speak to you uh, specifically and directly about that kind of speaking. Because some people, uh, you know, work for a corporation and they want to use their uh, communication skills to advance their work inside that organization or advance the organization. And some people have their own business and they speak to promote the business. And yeah. other people uh, either are or want to pursue a career in uh, professional speaking. So there's three different types of people that we work with. Amazing. And you, I mean, th what a way to start off day four here. And you had, you had me like, you were so good, Michael. This is how good you are. You got an extra three minutes. Whoa. That's how, cause you are That's heroic, my friend. You are, <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Port, my friend, thank you so much. Thank I'll you very you much. All good right. To see you, buddy. you too. All right, guys, Michael Port.